Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Adam Solberg, and I'm the co-director of the Center for International Strategy and Technology Policy, uh, which is the policy research arm of the Sam Nunn School here uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, and we are very fortunate to largely due to a very generous gift uh, that was provided to honor General Gray Davis. Uh, for those of you who don't know, General Davis uh, was a Georgia Tech alum. Uh, he graduated with a chemical engineering degree, uh, and he was a highly decorated, uh, retired four-star uh, general uh, in the U.S. Marine Corps. He was also a recipient of the Medal, Medal of Honor for his valor on the battlefields and during the Korean War. Uh, so um, for any of you who knew him or are here to remember him, we welcome you and we appreciate all of that support uh, that uh, was provided in his honor. Um, also, I want to note a couple of uh, events before I talk about uh, our issue at hand today. Uh, we have, this is a very busy semester for us, and it's largely busy not because of the numbers of events, but the quality of events, as you'll see today. Uh, but one, another event that I want to bring to everybody's attention will be uh, taking place on April 16th, and it will be the Sam Nunn Bank of America uh, Policy Forum, where we, we will be looking at the geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, dimensions to this emerging era of natural gas read a lot about. And what's interesting about this fora is several uh, things. One is the keynote speaker is going to be uh, the U.S. Secretary of Energy, uh, Secretary Moniz. And the second uh, distinguishing feature of this event will be we're going to look at that big panoply of issues from the perspective of a consumer region like the Southeast United States. Right? So the focus is not going to be so much on to frack or not to frack, it's going to be uh, what are some of the other uh, uh, factors that are associated uh, with this changing gas landscape. So I invite you all to pay attention. If you haven't registered on our email list, Aria has a list in the back. Uh, so I'd encourage you all to do that so that we can send those electronic uh, uh, invitations to you uh, as soon as they're released in the coming days. Uh, and I also want to thank Faria for pulling this all together and um, scolding uh, the pizza parlor for uh, their <laughs> delay. Um, so, like I said, I, it's a very uh, distinct and actual personal pleasure of mine to be able to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, who is uh, Dr. T.V. Paul, uh, who is the James McGill Professor of International Relations in the Department of Political Science at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Professor Paul, or I know the graduate students in my course, as well as most others uh, who are even casual readers of South Asia, uh, know that he's a well-established, if not leading scholar, in a multitude of areas, uh, from international security and non-proliferation, where he really cut his teeth and really made a mark, uh, to regional security issues, a uh, host of regional security issues uh, tied to uh, Southeast, uh, uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, he's also done a lot of work on the relationship between globalization and international security and on some of the strategic issues related to rising powers. Uh, so I uh, commend all of those different uh, areas of his work uh, to you. Um, needless to say, he's quite prolific. And in fact, it, this is a distinct personal honor for me because uh, truth be told, and I don't know if he'd want to take credibility or, uh, credit for this, but. TV has really been one of my role models from my early days as a graduate student because when I was starting out, he was ending, and he always had an air of, of um, just uh, calmness around him uh, in navigating the rocky shoals of academia, both as a graduate student and then, of course, uh, as, a, as a sterling professor in the field. And so TV, uh, his, he, his publications put all of us to shame. Uh, for our, our students here, he's really an exemplar of someone who does creative, uh, systematic, and rigorous, and policy-relevant work on big issues such as uh, nuclear proliferation or non-proliferation and uh, regional security. So I commend all of his work uh, to, to you, especially our students here who are trying to train in that likeness. Um, so, Without further ado, let me welcome my good friend, T.V., uh, to talk about his latest book, 
which is the warrior state, Pakistan in the contemporary world. And I can't think of a better thing to do with twenty dollars than to rush out and buy this at Amazon. Actually, but, this is how it looks. <laughs> but, but of course, the devil is in the details, and we'll find out what he has to say. Thank and you. I invite all of you to engage us in a nice conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and uh, Faria, for organizing this uh, uh, rather uh, nice uh, event. I'm on a kind of a book tour, and uh, yesterday I was in Washington, D.C. at the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, had the chance to meet quite a few NSC members. And, and I was uh, quite tired by the time I came this e uh, last evening, but then I looked at your beautiful city, and it's cold, but still walked around a little bit. But uh, it is like a bit of a homecoming in the sense that some of the colleagues here were my contemporaries or junior at uh, UCLA, where I visited last week and I was, it's like a second UCLA gathering sort of thing. But in any case, it is wonderful to be in your beautiful campus in the backdrop of a nice stadium. Okay, so I am, uh, uh, this is a, a book that I've been working for about seven years or even longer. I've been a student of South Asia for the last 25 years. And uh, in between, I go back to South Asia and I travel around in the region and also uh, do other stuff because I get tired of doing one project, uh, uh, only one region. So I'm trying to combine different uh, theoretical as well as intellectual traditions. Let me start off by arguing that Pakistan is a very important state, pivotal state if you want to call it, because of its, uh, not only for its linkages with respect to regional security and order, and um, that's why I got into this, because it has something like 300 million people by, it will have about 2050, it will be the fourth largest country in the world. Right now it's the sixth largest, 185 if you believe the number. Many works on South Asia describe, in fact some fantastic books have come out in recent years, and uh, especially on Pakistan, uh, a kind of journalistic or think tank scholars, good writings, people who do uh, interviews there or others. Um, but many social scientists or most social scientists have ignored this country. I don't know why, but it was a very difficult one to understand probably. And that's where I'm trying to make a, at least a little inroad. I'm trying to understand why Pakistan is so insecure, the insecurity predicament. And I am drawing ideas from historical sociology, international relations, comparative politics, military history, uh, strategic studies, etc. Uh, something that I think I have an advantage because many people who do comparative politics tend not to read the security studies literature or the deterrence literature or balance of power literature. And they all are very relevant for understanding this particular region and particular country. Let me make a, a disclaimer. I am doing that everywhere. My effort is not to apportion blame on Pakistan or take sides on the India-Pakistan conflict or try to argue K Pakistan should not get Kashmir or anything like that. I'm just a social science scholar. I'm interested in finding puzzles and problems and explaining. So I am willing to look at alternatives, but I'm trying to push the envelope, trying to explain the Pakistani phenomenon. My larger context, those who are, this is a nice map of Pakistan. The European context, in fact, I was at UCLA and the guy who taught us uh, European history, uh, Ronald Ragoski was sitting there in my seminar and I was very pleased to see him. At the end, he said, I haven't taught that course in about uh, 20 years or something. And I said, yeah, you should teach it again. He said, I'm going to do that. Uh, it was good to know that uh, he was uh, happy that I was referring to the literature that he taught me. Now, the European context is important here. There is an important uh, segment of the comparative sociology literature that argues that war and war making have been the key source of state formation and state strength uh, in Europe. Uh, none other than the um, uh, big name Charles Tilley made the statement war made the state and state made war. And it was a multi-state process elimination of external rivals, suppression or pacification of internal enemies, extraction of resources through taxation, and strengthening states made pacts with powerful social groups to confer them legitimacy. Now this doesn't mean that all European states that engage in war making became strong. 
In fact, many did not survive and some perished or became much weaker. Examples are many, uh, Byzantium, Burgundy, Austria, Hungary, Soviet Union. But clearly, Tilly has a point of that particular school that war was very pivotal for European state formation. Now the question is, is this very unique or whether we can apply it to the developing world? Uh, there are at least two key books that I can refer to that is applying this logic, Hebrey, Jeffrey Herb's work on Africa. African states did not become strong because they never experienced wars of conquest. Low population densities and abundant vacant land made them uh, less interested in that sort of thing. Um, Miguel Centeno argues that Latin American countries have been weak because they didn't wage big wars. And so they ended up with uh, civil wars. Now I find two problems. One is the circularity problem. Um, essentially that um, the original weakness did not allow states to wage big wars, which in turn caused these countries to remain weak. So that's very hard to make that connection proper. The second problem is the assumed inevitability of a positive correlation between war and state strength without giving allowance to the ruinous consequences that war can have on states. Winners need not become strong either. Uh, France was a winner, victor of World War I. Britain was the victor of World War II. But Britain probably declined considerably as a result of that war. Soviet Union drove its economy to the ground for its military preparations. So I argue that in the post-World War II period, war has become, or war preparation have become counterproductive for state capacity. State building is no longer narrowly focused on cohesive capacity, but the integrative power of the state and the ability of the state to invest in its people. In national security states, not all of them have become weaker. Those who became stronger adopted what you call a developmental state approach, a trading state approach. And this is where Pakistan comes across as one that did not make it because of its lack of focus on developmental aspects. Pakistan's development, 66 years, intense focus on military preparedness, four wars, like I said, I'm not blaming Pakistan, it had all the reasons to be focusing on it, 47, 48, 65, 1971, over half of the time military rule, democratic inter interludes are hybrid systems because the military has what you call the uh, veto power on key national security and foreign policy issues. Now, Pakistan has been attempting to achieve a kind of um, strategic parity with India. I will talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Well, here is a material capability differentiation between its chief rival, Pakistan, India and Pakistan. Uh, one to seven, one to eight on most parameters. Before the bifurcation of Bangladesh, one to four. Obviously, I want to talk a little bit about the grim statistics that is coming out of Pakistan, uh, on Pakistan. The failed state index uh, talks about it uh, almost uh, on top of the 10 uh, weakest states uh, for the last six, seven years, performances on various areas, in various areas. Um, sectarian killings is definitely worsened. Um, 2013, that's the number. But last January of this year alone, you have something like 600 deaths, and that's just increasing. It's going to get worse, I think, unfortunately. Most of all, 124th among 144 countries in global competitiveness index. It's one of the least globalized uh, country in economic terms. It's obviously globalized in the bad aspects of globalization. Pakistan has some 110 nuclear weapons and plans to deploy 60 kilometer range tactical nuclear weapons on the border with India. Some silver linings, limited progress in democratic transition. First time the military did not intervene when a democratically elected government gave power handed over power to another democratically elected government. Military is remaining in the barracks. Uh, some efforts, especially Nawaz Sharif's uh, uh, government is planning or talking about peace. More efforts at economic integration. The European Union gave a deal. Dialogue with the United States, a strategic dialogue for the first time includes trade. 
This is something that I yesterday I mentioned and they all agree that this should have been from day one. Yet the prognosis is not good. Taliban both within and in Afghanistan have stepped up their attack. Afghanistan could unravel in today's New York Times is a very re really depressing story about what's going on with the Taliban and the killings of those Taliban that want to negotiate with the Afghan government. Now my effort here is to explain Pakistan's weak state syndrome. Why Pakistan is finding it so hard to become a strong state. And um, I'm not um, uh, trying to understand everything relating to Pakistan, but I'm trying to understand two, uh, I, or I try to offer two explanations that I will come in a, in a second. My paper got a little disconnected. Okay. Now I'm asking two questions. Why does Pakistan remain a weak state despite intense focus on national security for such a long period of time? And secondly, why, hasn't it, why, has it, uh, that, why is that the elite of Pakistan pursues policies that have not brought long-term security or prosperity to Pakistan? Now, when countries realize that they are not becoming stronger or secure or prosperous, sometimes they readapt their strategies. In this case, adaptation is very, very slow or it's not happening. And my argument is that social scientists have not offered a good answer to these two puzzles. So I'm trying to come up with an explanation developing based on both structural and um, agency-driven factors. I look at the geostrategic circumstance of Pakistan and the ideas, now I'm not a constructivist, but those IR people sitting here know, but I like the notion of ideas and strategies, which by the way has a lot of appeal to me in, from various other uh, sociological and uh, other disciplines. Now the question is, oh, how, do we, how do these two are linked? I argue that Pakistan has um, a substantial importance for the great power system, great power conflicts. It's situated in the kind of right place, if you want to call it. And this has generated considerable wealth to Pakistan through aid and for, you know, interactions. But that is not enough. You need to look at the ideas that propel the elite of Pakistan. I'm not arguing again, I want to emphasize because I, I'm sure there are Pakistani people of Pakistani origin will find it difficult to take my argument. But I would argue that I'm not arguing Pakistan has not faced threats or conflicts. Not arguing Kashmir conflict did not matter. Not arguing Indian behavior did not matter. But countries that face big rivalries and territorial disputes have faced their conflict differently. Here the elite's ideas and strategies matter. I come up with a concept called geostrategic curse. I'm adapting from the literature on resource curse and foreign aid curse and oil curse, basically. Pakistan has been simultaneously blessed and cursed with geostrategic importance for great powers due to its location and the willingness of the elite to participate in great power competition. During the Cold War, Pakistan was the chosen ally of the United States. It received considerable support in return for base facilities. During the 80s, it was the conduit for supply of weapons and funds to the, uh, to the Afghan resistance. Since 2001, it has been a key ally of the United States in the war uh, in Afghanistan. And Pakistan has been the Israel of China in many sense. And Saudi Arabia, a lot of other countries. This participation geopolitical competition brought billions of dollars and modern weaponry to Pakistan. The European internal extraction and Southeast Asian examples of internal innovation and external trade have been absent in the Pakistani case, other than, of course, a short period of Ayub Khan. As the military elite became key players in economic and political systems, major efforts at domestic extraction or economic reforms were not undertaken. This is somewhat similar to um, this is somewhat similar to foreign aid curse, which is actually a big topic discussed in the literature and um, aid has a lot of problems uh, what it does is um, these are some of the problems of the literature identifies 
hinders the middle class, undermines stability, takes away pressure to reform, encourages patent-client relationship, no long-term investments in productive sectors because allies will be there to ba bail you out whenever there is a crisis as it's happening, just happened recently with the IMF coming up with the uh, big rescue package. A great example of uh, internal capacity of a state is how much tax it can collect. Pakistan is one of the least tax collecting states in the world. New York Times in July 2010 made this uh, uh, important uh, revelation. Out of 170 million Pakistanis, only 2% pay any income tax, making Pakistan's revenue from taxes among the lowest in the world, a notch below Sierra Leone in terms of ratio of tax to gross domestic product. And this report said some 10 million Pakistanis should be paying income tax, but only, even, uh, only 2.5 million are even registered. Pakistan obviously gets a lot of money through uh, remittances, uh, Pakistanis working abroad. Now this also ha can be a curse, as in many other situations, uh, because it also disincentivizes the, the elite to do anything else. Uh, Pakistan got in 2013 some 14 billion dollars. So, between two, si 1960 and 2012, it was 0.73.1 billion dollars from bilateral and multilateral sources. Uh, U.S. provided some 30 percent. Japan, France, U.K., Germany, uh, IMF, World Bank, etc., offering the rest. Between 2002 and 2010, Pakistan has gotten more than two billion dollars per year from the United States. The military Pakistan is becoming a part of the landed aristocracy in some sense. Now this is actually looking at the European history also. The worst cocktail you can get when a military elite is given land in return for its uh, services. And retiring from Pakistani army is one of the most lucrative things you can get. Uh, top echelons get a lot of acres of land in, uh, and also become members of the various uh, corporations and entities. Now, there is a fascinating book on this subject by Aisha Sethika, a kind of a critical Pakistani journalist, uh, scholar, uh, Military Inc. You must read that to show the extent of military's penetration in the industrial sector of Pakistan, the various um, service sector, etc. We can, we can talk about the need for that too in some extent because I met the guy who run one of the foundations, there are several foundations that run, and uh, he said that, um, actually I sympathized with him, he said that, imagine we don't f offer these services like uh, disaster relief or taking care of the uh, millions of ex-soldiers, uh, uh, who will take care of them? And so we have a necessity. So that's a kind of a self-perpetuating process, but uh, there is no private industry or private sector to do this sort of services. Well, first of all, they are not allowing, and that's part of the problem. But I want to go beyond that. This only explains part of the problem uh, at hand. Ideas are very important. I'm using the goldstein cohen definition of discussion about ideas and foreign policy. And you see that ideas affect the roadmaps, embedded them in institutions, and blinders on people, reducing number of alternatives. But clearly, strategies are determined by the ideas elite hold. The dominant ideas of the Pakistani elite, this is actually, I'm drawing quite a bit from Stephen Cohen's work, which if you haven't read, is called uh, The Idea of Pakistan. It actually, the ideas come from kind of a realist Hobbesian world. This is somewhat similar to Wilhelmina in Germany or Prussia to some extent, that you need a strong national security state, your enemies are predatory, and that they will any time pounds upon you if, if opportunity comes and will destroy you. And it's a realist world, self-help system, relative gains matter, national security, territorial security, all most important goals of a state. Trade and economic welfare are secondary only if it helps the national security state. Extreme conflict is the nature of interstate politics and the preservation of the state from predatory adversaries is the primary function of the state. Obviously, borrowing the Vendian classification, although he's borrowing from other people, the idea of Lokian ideas or rivalry exists, but unlimited violence or fear of denying sovereignty is not there, or Kantian ideas are 
kind of absent in this discourse. Armed forces are a model for Pakistani society. Uh, again, Cohen's uh, words, selfless, disciplined, obedient and competent. Deep-rooted social or economic reforms, including land reforms and universal literacy are too risky for a state that was already unstable and pressed from the outside by dangerous enemies. Some of the ideas are drawn from British colonial eras, especially the idea of strategic depth. And conflict with India is natural. In order to avoid, you need a strategic parity and a balance of power and deterrence, all the things that we in IR worry about. Such parity is obtainable and desirable, uh, even though it may impose high cost on society. The size differential is big, but you can over overcome that by pursuing crafty strategies, relationship with great powers, acquisition of weapon systems, including nuclear weapons. Religious ideological strength adds to Pakistan's balancing effort. I think I go deeper into the notion of strategic parity, bringing in the civilizational aspect of it, something that is actually missing in the literature. I'm not Huntingtonian, but I'm interested in that dimension. The desire for parity has deep roots in South Asia's history. It can be traced to the demand for a Muslim homeland to regain the lost power of the Muslim minority and the conceptual inheritance of the Mughal Empire. Now, this is also a competition for status, and I will uh, discuss that concept in the larger context. It's not a typical Hindu-Muslim conflict as people talk about. It is a belief that Muslims ought to be co-equals with uh, Hindus in terms of, uh, if you look at that civilizational aspect because Muslims controlled South Asia for a thousand years. It was in 1857, the first so-called War of Independence for the Indians, or the mutiny for the British, that the Muslims were given a lower rank in the society because the, the revolt was led by many uh, Muslim uh, rulers of Northern India. And so when, um, Jinnah was conceptualizing the state. He was hoping for a co-equality, really getting more than what he got. Uh, entire Punjab, entire Bengal, obviously Kashmir. But he didn't get all he wanted, so he called it a moth-eaten Pakistan. And that really hurt them psychologically, because they were hoping for equality. And the Indians obviously didn't treat them nicely. Initially, the, the distribution of resources, uh, they were not given. You may recall Gandhi had to go on a fast and to death to get uh, Pakistan the allocated resources. And then um, uh, Gandhi was assassinated probably because of that. Now, Pakistan needs strategic depth. I discussed a lot of that, the ideas coming of uh, British colonial uh, strategic thinkers, the fear of the Russian Empire, etc., and that the impact of that on uh, the strategic thinking. So my argument is that um, country of this nature is an intense national security state and it is engaging in not just a security competition but a status competition with its uh, neighbor. And it is losing that status competition partly because uh, after the end of the Cold War, until the end of the Cold War, the Western world treated it as co-equal with India, India, Pakistan hyphenated. Uh, after the Cold War ended, India started liberalizing, economy started picking up, America started embracing India. Now you don't hear that hyphenation. So that generates a lot of frustration for the Pakistani elite. And I can understand that. And that is part of the big challenge they are facing. Now, how do you get change in a, such a milieu? Interestingly, those who study revolutions and social change will find that two alternative, two mechanisms need to be, either it is internally driven or externally propelled to some extent, or people imitate other countries. You need a middle class, you know, the Paddington Moore kind of statement, no bourgeois, no democracy kind of thing. Pakistan, unfortunately, doesn't have a big middle class, which is a big challenge, and a civil society. Or you need labor class ready to fight, as you just witnessed in the Ukrainian capital or in Egypt or what Egypt is an example of similar to Pakistan and the civil society should have ideas for transforming the country and the passion for changing the country Pakistan definitely has a civil society but at times they fight like the lawyers fighting for getting rid of Musharraf 
Then they end up supporting the killer of a governor who was uh, uh, defending the Christian minorities' rights. You know, things like that. It shows that it's not a consistent uh, struggle for transformation. Pressures of change can come from outside. And here the United States is unfortunately has had a very short term view of Pakistan. It's been a kind of patron client relationship, unlike US relationship with Korea or Taiwan. And very rarely the US put any conditionalities because the fear is that Pakistan will collapse and that will affect American security. Or more than that, the ability of Pakistani elite to negotiate. There's an interesting book by Teresita Schaefer and her husband Howard, Howard Schaefer called How Pakistan Negotiates. Extremely successful in tactical victor negotiations with the United States. Using This is an asymmetric negotiation, actually. It's a fascinating topic by itself how the weaker party uses uh, ideas to gain more through negotiations. But this has not made the US popular at all in Pakistan. In fact, it's more hated, US is more, more hated than India today, if you may recall. US aid to Korea and Taiwan in the 1960s and 1970s, US aid demanded structural change in economic integration with the world market. And World Bank and IMF were also uh, involved some extent, but obviously the big source of change are domestic change, they are bureaucratic elite, uh, a developmental elite, passionate about change. And other countries like China obviously has, is not going to pressure Pakistan to change. Saudi Arabia did a lot of harm by starting madrasas rather than other schools. So my effort in one of my chapters is to, here is your Mughal Empire by the way, I just met a guy from Uzbekistan who is a diplomat in residence in our school. Babur, who invaded India and established the Mughal Empire, was from Uzbekistan. I was, you know, you realize that this was, you talk about regional orders and you see the region going up all the way to the Soviet <laughs> or ex-Soviet republics. And uh, obviously they didn't reach uh, southern India, which was quite interesting. The pre-partition India. You had uh, 500 odd states, half independent, protectorates of British Empire. The gray uh, area, lightly gray area is all directly controlled by Great Britain. And they had also control over Burma up to Singapore. Again, the notion of s uh, regions can change. So, this sort of um, are the major uh, issues I'm talking about. But I think those comparatives sitting here will find my chapter on comparing Pakistan with two national security states that faced intense conflict, that is uh, Taiwan and Korea, and three Muslim majority states that also put a lot of emphasis on military security. And their trajectories have been somewhat different except for probably Egypt. I know it's not a perfect comparison, but uh, I think no two countries are perfectly comparable anyway. South Korea and Taiwan prove that a national security state can also become strong through developmental approach. Both became democracies after playing with intense military rule. Here, of course, some structural conditions, Japanese colonialism, despite its brutality, did a lot of good to these places in terms of industrialization, in terms of uh, getting rid of the power of the landed aristocracy, education, a lot of things that uh, Japan did. Uh, brutal, one has to say. British colonials were not very good in any of that. And obviously, India and Pakistan are suffering as a result to some extent. But here, I think the biggest thing is the bureaucracy. Atul Kohli has this interesting book on the bureaucracy. Uh, they adopted what he called a developmental state approach. Uh, Pakistan has been pure national security approach, uh, pursuing a pure national security approach. The South Korean and Taiwanese elite realize that if they do not modernize, popular discontent will affect their defense. The relationship between security and defense is so clear that they are also putting emphasis on defense, but they knew that people would not support their defense efforts. They also had absence of a strong rural elite, but the bureaucracy definitely played a big role in these countries. And 
They made use of the wars that the United States fought in Asia, especially Japan's experience with Korea, but in this case, Vietnam War. They intensely traded with the United States as a result of these um, uh, U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Pakistan, unfortunately, has not benefited from Afghanistan, the two wars. Only short period I mentioned, Ayub Khan's period, which was actually quite good for Pakistan. But the 65 war onwards, Pakistan has been on a downward spiral. Uh, spiral. Export or die was the mantra that East Asian states adopted. Of course, they had uh, something they could uh, look up to, Japan. Um, so that approach has been missing in the Pakistani elites thinking, partly because it's a landed aristocracy. Land reforms have not taken place in Pakistan. Um, let me talk a little bit about Turkey. Turkey also has been very focused on national security state. Of course, a different approach. Secularism was the big approach there, top-down transformation, but a highly intense realpolitik approach. And those who visit Turkey realize the military, at least until recently, had such a dominant uh, position. At least four military coups. They also had separatist, Kurdish separatists, and conflict with Greece over Cyprus. Cyprus muted because of the NATO membership. Um, but Turkey balanced security concerns with the need for economic development. It's like a semi-developmental state. Um, until the uh, 1960s, it was growing reasonably OK, 4.6% for a decade. After 1990s, Turkey has been growing quite well, became a G20 state. But now it's probably all G20 are affected. Had land reforms early on. Now Turkey has made partial uh, transformation. It has become uh, more democratic, if you want to call it, although I don't know how you want to define it. Turkey uh, at least controls its military. Several of them are in jail. The AKP party has done initially some good uh, progress. But the fear is that Turkey may become more authoritarian with the AKP continuing certain policies. I think my next case, Indonesia, is definitely the most interesting one and something Pakistan could emulate. This is the largest Muslim country in the world. It received considerable assistance from the United States. It had several internal conflicts. Yes, it did not have a big external conflict or rival. Its armed forces was in control, but it engaged in successful transformation. Over time, it got rid of the military rule, despite military wanted to be a big player in it. And it got rid of its internal conflicts and its external interventions in East Timor and internal conflict in Aceh. It pursued a mild secular strategy with the Panjshir approach. Um, and by 2007, several elected governments managed to stay on to democratic transition, control the military. Pakistan could definitely hope to get there. By 2007, Freedom House declared Indonesia free, uh, fully free. Uh, obviously, there are some things going on there. But after the 2002 Bali bombings, Indonesia put a real control over the terrorists or the non-state actors, unlike Pakistan. Indonesia pursued a pro-growth policy, despite widespread corruption. And it has been a pro-developmental state. Obviously, it has its uh, weaknesses, poverty, etc. But it is quite an impressive uh, periods of growth and periods of, you know, happening the cycles uh, to many of these countries. <coughs> Egypt is probably following Pakistan's path, except that the military is now back in power. And uh, similarities are many, and differences are there too, intense focus on national security state. Uh, Pakistan, I mean, Egypt has been getting at least $2 billion a year from the United States. And but the difference here is that the U.S. put a condition that peace with Israel, otherwise the money will be cut off. And it has definitely moderated its foreign policy goals. Uh, now you know the story of 2011 Arab Spring, uh, the transformation taking place. Very difficult trajectory going through. Next two, three minutes, let me conclude my uh, kind of uh, conclusions here. One argument people make or criticize uh, for this sort of logic is time will make a difference. Pakistan has been in existence for 66 years, whereas European states took some 400 to 
600 years to become strong. My argument is that in the modern times or in contemporary world, you don't need a whole lot of time. It took only two decades for China to achieve whatever it did. Korea and Taiwan probably less than that. Time is compressed today's world. Many Latin American countries have been in existence for over 150 years, but none has become stronger as a kind of linear progression. Taiwan, China, Korea, even India and ASEAN countries have changed and transformed in terms of economic goals at least a short period of time. Contemporary national security states needed to adopt a trading and development. I'm emphasizing that, that is my biggest argument to the Pakistani elite uh, to become stronger. If they are going to ignore that, they will remain considerably weaker over the years. And so without Deng Xiaoping, China would be a basket case. Without India's reforms in 91, India would have been a basket case. Security is no longer border security. You can have military disputes, but you need to focus on trade and investment and engagement with the rest of the world. Large scale war making as the European states engage is no longer available to become strong. You play with large scale war making, you become Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea or North Korea. Pakistan has not benefited from war preparation because it has not been a developmental state. Pakistan has not encouraged its younger generation to globalize and benefit from economic liberalization, as has been the case with China and to some extent India. They are not given the necessary education, especially in science and technology. Pakistan has very few technical institutions. Pakistan has therefore missed out the post-war, post-Cold War economic boom especially the benefits of globalization associated with greater international trade, investment and mobility of workforce globally. None of, by the way, crisis is a propelling thing for countries to transform. It was 1991, there was a big crisis in India, foreign exchange crisis that forced them to change. None of the crises that Pakistan faced, big enough, but every time it faced a crisis, there is an external aid coming to patch it up, to keep it uh, going because the fear that it collapses is a major con you know, d difficulty. Major transformation is necessary in the way Pakistani elite, civil society and expatriate community think of security and development. You cannot wait for all your territorial disputes to settle with India and Pakistan, Afghanistan. Until then, you ca you're giving the veto power to your enemies. You can do both simultaneously. Pakistan's key allies, the US and China, need to rethink their strategy. US really needs a long-term economic engagement with this country. Cannot continue this client-state, patent-client relationship based on military aid or band-aid for services. And you cannot modernize without making Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and Central Asia and India a part of a larger trade network. China is focusing on infrastructure but it has been miserable in terms of the economic development of Pakistan. It really could offer a lot more by way of trade. Instead of emphasizing balance of power competition, deterrence, nuclear materials, etc. You need regional economic integration connectivity. If you have any chance of Afghanistan coming out of this tragic situation it is. India definitely has a big role to play. It should not securitize its water uh, disputes. It should avoid repressive policies in Kashmir and open up its economy, engage its civil society with Pakistan as much as, as possible without seeking full reciprocity. Obviously, it's hard on them, but India needs creative strategies. It has to be more generous with Pakistan on trade. It probably needs a new Gujarat doctrine. It needs to strengthen the SARC and SAFTA, which is the regional trade organization. So let me conclude by arguing that Pakistani media and leading commentators are writing more on the need for economic approach. In fact, it's fascinating to read the English language newspapers of Pakistan, except that every day it starts with 30 killed or 40 killed, which is, spoils your day. But at the same time, I am forced to read it now for this purpose. And so official discourse is reflecting some rethinking. But I don't know, yesterday I was at um, Council on Foreign Relations, even they don't know, the people who deal with Pakistani on a daily basis, do they have the powerful group decision makers surrounding um, Sharif to make that push to a transformation.
But one thing is clear, Pakistan's trajectory will be a key determinant as to whether we get peace and stability for almost two billion South Asians and also global security, whether our children will be fighting wars in Afghanistan or going to school. Their children too, not our children alone. So here we are. Thank you. Thank you. So as mentioned, TV's, at, well, first off, there's uh, pizza there, so I encourage you guys to sort of go back and forth. But uh, while you're doing that, uh, TV is very graciously uh, said that he'd be happy to entertain questions not only on the book and on the particular argument here about uh, the warrior state, but also about broader uh, South Asian regional security uh, issues. So please, questions from the floor? Can you just state your name and yes. where you are? Just so. I'm Mickey Fabry, uh, assistant professor at the uh, Sandman School. Um, I want to ask you to what extent uh, is the weakness of, of the Pakistan state attributable to uh, the lack of legitimacy of the Pakistan state in the eyes of various domestic groups in Pakistan? Hmm. That was important for for Tilly, but was not uh, listed in your. Uh, in your argument, you have the historical secession in Baluchistan, you have FATA, in which there are various groups that don't seem to identify very strongly with the Pakistan mm. state, even that there is some kind of equilibrium that you know, gets upset and then, you know. Um, so it seems that, um, you know, you talked about Turkey, but it seems that um, Pakistan has even more serious problem than Turkey, historically speaking. And, uh, you know, in my mind, it is a significant reason for its weakness. But I have actually, that's why I wanted to read the book, <laughs> which actually goes into the sectarian differences. And the effort to uh, use uh, Islam uh, as a bridging force. Uh, that hasn't worked out because who's Islam? Pakistan has very powerful minorities, you know, the Hamadi minority, there is um, Shia minority. But unfortunately, over the years, Pakistan has become a Sunni dominated country, with especially Shia al period. And that it has done very poorly in regional integration, especially Baluchistan, you just mentioned. I have extensive discussion on their inability to uh, develop that part of the Pakistan, ex uh, despite that it is a big provider of natural gas and other uh, minerals. And that it is one thing that the so-called Punjabi elite, that is the ruling elite of Punjab, uh, Pakistan, has not done at all is to bring up uh, the different uh, segments of that country. Losing Bangla B Bengal, East Bengal, or you know East, East Pakistan. Now one can say Indian intervention was there, but it happened after, as a result of internal processes uh, taking place. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new books coming. There's a new book called The Blood Telegram. You may want to look at that. Uh, fascinating study on Mr. Blood, who was the Pakistan American Consul General in uh, uh, Dhaka. And he was reporting on a daily basis the cruelties going on, and um, um, and the Kissinger uh, Nixon team simply ignoring that on balance of power grounds. But anyway, that apart, losing that was quite an extent the inability of the elite. And here I blame Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. I mean, we all identify Bhutto's as great uh, champions or whatever. But in this case, uh, he made two major critical errors. Actually, three. Uh, the first. I think was he was one of the big small group that started the 65 war uh, decision making group and impressing upon Ayub Khan to initiate that war. That really destroyed uh, US relationship, US put sanctions as a result and then the East Bengal, uh, East Pakistanis started very unhappy with them and obviously relations with India. So and they didn't get whatever they were fighting for. So that losing that territory because after the elections, you remember 1970, the Bengali is won the election or the majority and Bhutto would refuse to give him, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, East, uh, East Pakistan leader, a chance to form a government. And as a result, uh, that was a secessionist movement, obviously supported heavily by India, intervened and it succeeded. Now this, is, this could have been probably avoided if Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was given a chance to run the country. They would not do that and that was part of the challenge. So I think this is the problem. Um, religion is a strong binding force but uh, then I, I mentioned uh, the Bhutto's 
uh, Islamization, you know, declaring the Ahmadi minorities, tiny minority, two million, as un-Islamic, and then Shias now facing uh, big challenges. Even uh, Ismailis were a rather peaceful part of Pakistan, and they are facing challenges. So it's tough to integrate based on religion because of the sectarian differences. And what else can integrate them? Economics could be a welfare state is one that integrates. I mean, whatever integration India is going through is probably because it has some semblance of secularism, some semblance of, uh, you know, federalism, some semblance of democracy participation. Not a perfect one. I'm always critical of that. But legitimacy cannot come through top-down coercive approach or even bringing in this uh, narrow conception of religion uh, into it. So that story is discussed in a big detail in my book, and uh, but I, I don't want to say everything. It's a huge uh, country with a lot of history, a lot of interesting issues. So uh, that's all I would say. Please. My name is Masarat Hussain, and I come from Pakistan. Sure. Whatever you have said, a lot of is true. Uh, religion was a uniting force Initially. when the country was created. But now, the religion is a dividing force in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And Pakistan is suffering both from internal security, which is hurting the investment, business, and trade. And, and it is hurting because of the foreign security concerns. Mm -hmm. You see the problem in Balochistan, and, and then uh, what is going on in the northern part the Fatah area, right. we all know about that. I don't know, I came a bit late, but Pakistan's problems started initially after Bhutto, but when, Afghani when Afghanistan was invaded by Russia, mm. Pakistan came at the forefront to support the United States. Taliban was the creation of Pakistan and the United States. Sure. Pa Taliban leaders came to US they went to White House, and now they have become enemies. So these are the issues which hurting Pakistan in promoting trade, business, investment. Mm -hmm. Now let, let me make a quick comment. This is a kind of a general Pakistani understanding or people who, I agree with quite a bit of what he said, but the only point I disagree is that it assumes the major blame is on outsiders, the United States especially. It seems the Pakistani elite is somewhat innocent victims of this situation. That's not the case. Pakistani elite played a big role in making use of this so-called geostrategic rent that was coming out of this relationship. Now, I don't want to say U.S. did nothing wrong. Now, obviously, yeah, Reagan administration, I mean, you read the book, Ghost Wars, you know, see how much they have been hurting. But that is not enough for an elite to claim that we are just victims. You made certain choices during this period, you means the elite during this period, see Aul Huck in particular, uh, and those choices are not simply forced by the United States alone, obviously the US is giving them incentives, but it is clearly certain uh, ideas they have about certain strategies and that have hurt them. That's what I'm saying, that it's it, instead of using the US relationship for trade and investment, there the blame goes to the U.S. too, that it became more like uh, aid as the number one source of economic activity. So I'm saying that none of whatever said you said is very correct, uh, but those conditions, a, a different set of uh, uh, elite could have used that condition for a major economic benefits to Pakistan, trade relationship. They ignore trade, that's what I, all I'm trying to say. Uh, <coughs> How much has the warrior state integrated cyber into its offensive capabilities? I mean, does, does Pakistan have a, a way of, of um, attacking India with cyber weapons? Um, and, and how has the militarization of cyber affected the domestic um, development of a cyber state? I have to plead uh, in this. Uh, Actually, why don't we re rephrase this a little bit? What, mm. How has the changing nature Technology. of conflict and military conflict mm. affected the war-making state, especially a national security state, given the modernization that's going on in Pakistan, both on the nuclear front, mm. where they now face, you know, interesting paradoxes, mm. right? The mm -hmm. vulnerability and vulnerability paradox on the nuclear front. Right. The, the other types of the conventional uh, information 
types mm. of issues. How is yeah. the changing <laughs> nature of warfare affecting your argument? I am uh, rather depressed, <laughs> to be honest with you, the impact of uh, nuclear weapons. I'm not arguing that South Asia doesn't need nuclear weapons per se. I mean, you need nuclear weapons for a limited deterrent. But they are putting a lot of emphasis on nuclear weapons as if that's going to bring a lot of transformation to this region. No. Nuclear deterrence and balance of power at status quo maintaining systems, they don't promote change. In fact, they hurt change because countries don't have to change. Here I think that because I, I could answer part of your question, Adam, that is, I think South Asia is becoming the next theater or currently emerging as a theater of uh, nuclear arms race. Uh, Pakistan has started or planning to de deploy some 60 uh, or 60 kilometer range uh, short range missiles on the border in response to India's uh, potential reaction in a crisis like the uh, 2001 parliament attack and the Mumbai attacks and the so called uh, Cold War, uh, Cold Start doctrine of mass offensive if they are attacked again in the, uh, in the interior. But um, the point is that it is the most destabilizing aspect of military planning going on there. Because those who know the impact of short range missiles is that you've given command authority to the commander on the ground. Because you can cut off once the war starts. And if the command, if, if one nuclear weapon is used, the Indian reaction is they will retaliate massively and the Pakistanis will retaliate too. This is a recipe for fundamental disaster for a region so prone to crisis. So I am uh, rather uh, unhappy in, as a scholar, in, you know, people have engaged with this, that they are going into the route NATO and Warsaw Pact went through and got rid of uh, short range especially. And you don't need that kind of a, a nuclear escalatory behavior there. Why not talk of confidence building measures? Why not develop, use technology for um, verification and confidence building? It is very feasible. It's not totally impossible to think about developing a hotline. A terrorist attack in Mumbai or someplace, maybe Pakistan has nothing to do with it. But how do you communicate that to the Indians and try to make sure they respond uh, in a way that will create a nuclear crisis? So technology has been used very selectively in this case. Um, Indians have an advantage on some of these things. IT especially is a good deal there. Uh, the remote sensing is good. But I don't know whether this is really uh, all militaries are modernizing. I think the Pakistani military got some drones, if I am not incorrect. And that Indians are buying drones. And uh, so there is a lot of that competition going on. But India is modernizing with China in view too. So it's kind of this trilateral context that we need to look into. And then the involvement of now Japan and India, a little bit uh, friendship. US obviously is a big player there. So balance of power is re-emerging in this region uh, competition. And with uh, unpredictable outcomes, because the region has great potential for economic integration. That may not happen if competi competitive interactions emerge. So I'm not uh, very much up on the technical aspect. All I can say that nuclear arms race is not going well as they thought initially. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if you can comment on Pakistan and Iran relationship. <laughs> um, I'm Sohail Shail from School of Industrial Engineering and I'm from Iran. Um, because a few years back, Iran initiated a, a natural gas pipeline to India, mm. pipeline. And when you are blaming the Pakistani leader, but I think it was US who push Pakistan is to withdraw from that pipeline, which could bring some kind of stability, as you were saying about the trade and it, you know, bind the countries through this kind of energy or other kind of trade. Yeah. yeah. I am all uh, in support of uh, uh, gas pipeline, not only from Iran, but also from Central Asia through Afghanistan to India. Uh, unfortunately, the argument is that it's a big investment. Security is not guaranteed. Anyone can destroy the pipeline any minute. Therefore, uh, it's probably not worth uh, money. But you're right, the US is that uh, put pressure on India, especially, and Pakistan, not to proceed. Although Iran and Pakistan have made some progress recently. I think uh, the US has to think big, but it's part of the whole uh, sanctions regime that the US put on Iran. Uh, it cannot be just isolated because it, they don't want any dealings with Iran. No? So I think if you want to talk about uh, regional connectivity, regional peace, we need to think of 
not only these one gas pipeline, but there are quite a few other potential. And hydropower, I've been talking, pushing for this idea of India is building some seven or eight dams on the Indus River, various Indus and uh, tributary rivers in Kashmir. Why not make uh, energy as a source of cooperation? Give Pakistan a part of that energy that comes out of it and develop the Kashmir region with the money that they could gain out of that. So all that require a kind of a, a better thinking among the elite. They all have desire, but nobody wants to take that first step. This is a sign of an intense national security mind, a Hobbesian world, basically, that is dominating this region. So Iran and Pakistan have, I think, done some reasonably good work in this area, but they are part of the global, uh, you know, great power conflict system, etc. So some of them are beyond their control. Yes, back there. stability and peace in the country before we move towards economic development. Mm. And as you might see that Pakistan has been in the nexus of two very big global strategic battles, I would say, over the last 30 years, which haven't given our society the stability that some other countries have compared Pakistan with God. Initially, like, and I don't blame the international community for that. Uh, our leaders at that time, our policy institutions are mostly responsible for that. But won't you agree that the transaction relationship established by the international community during that time, if you say, even during the Cold War and post-Cold War, since Pakistan couldn't benefit from the post-Cold War economic boom because we were dealing with a huge, uh, not only strategic conflict in terms of power struggles within Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but a huge, uh, I would say, influx of refugees coming from Pakistan. And as you were Okay. And, sorry, I keep on going, but uh, for in the next coming two years, what's the way forward? Because the way I see it, uh, if past, from past experiences, this is a huge distrust, which is unfortunate, but what can the Western world do, at least in terms of ensuring mm. that Pakistan doesn't fall back in the same situation that it fell into uh, in the post World War situation? Yeah. Where we are not focusing on education and health, rather, we are just focusing on strategic depth maybe in a one Which by the way is a dumb idea. Exactly it is. Yeah. So like <laughs> in the nuclear context. At that time we were by ourselves. It was a, it was a, and on, on an added note, Pakistan has been dealt with, and Pakistan has had military rule over a long period of time. And yes, some people are to blame for it. And when people talk to Not the people, I blame the elite. People are pretty good. <laughs> exactly, but because the systems, systems develop with time, right? If you compare India and Pakistan, they started at the same point. And essentially, I can tell you, I mean, it's, it's similar people, right? Similar, almost opposite. Okay, you need stuff. To, yeah. But don't you think that the stability systems like India did have, and even for the Western world, don't you think they have been, <coughs> since it's more convenient for them to interact with one person, military rulers? Let, let him, let him, you've thrown a lot of issues. You, around. you are, you actually, you gave a very good uh, Pakistani viewpoint. I, I agree with most of it, actually, but I disagree with this blaming the rest of the world for our problems, sort of, South Asians do that all, all over, not only Pakistanis, Indians do that, um, Sri Lankans do that, you know, we're very good at that. Let me tell you that um, you have some point about, this is a chicken or egg problem. In fact, if you read my book, this is what I'm arguing against, that security 
goal of security and economic development can go together. Pakistan proves that in the 1950s and until 1965. Okay, Ayub Khan proves that you can do both. He was part of the Cold War alliance. In fact, Ayub Khan may be the only real ruler of Pakistan that will come out of this. Pakistan was a model economy, by the way, for many countries. Karachi is the place where South Koreans visited to find out the planning. South Korea was weaker than Pakistan. But they had an economic plan. Obviously, they have a lot of US, uh, uh, US uh, extended deterrence, etc. But here, this is where people like you have to start focusing on. Pakistan has to take responsibility. That means leaders have to take responsibility for the choices they have made. Unfortunately, the internal integration, uh, I mentioned that, or using this external relationship for greater international trade, investment, etc. If we wait for all the conflict to solve, then they will come. They are never going to come. Pakistan needed to develop a grand strategy that included trade with the United States. I was in a track two meeting with Pakistani ex-officials and uh, US ex-officials and uh, the big discussion was security and I was asked to comment on a paper on balance of power. And I made a, a dumb statement that uh, why is there not a single trade representative sitting here in this meeting? And the response of the Pakistani members were rather harsh. They said, you don't understand our, pro our problem is all security. Once we solve security, we will have trade. It is never going to happen like that. You really need a grand strategy that uses your, your economic niche. Completely abandoning. I have no understanding why Pakistan could not start at least 10 technical schools, why Pakistan has initiated most educational reforms, some limited, obviously. Why Pakistan is relying on this transactional, you write absolutely, uh, this aid and uh, relationship. So this blame goes both ways. Yes, Americans have to be blamed. But America is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, Caritas International. It is, uh, has a grand strategy. It is also a national security state, somewhat crude. It is not going to be doing everything uh, to please Pakistan or anybody for charity. So unfortunately, American thinking, the, the, the uh, elite in America also, you know, three-year term, we you know some of them already sitting in various councils. They come and go. They don't have a long-term understanding of this region, for instance. So we can blame up to a point, but the notion of double games, you know, it's rather difficult for Pakistanis to accept that. That is rather what has been going on. And so in a sense, we need to look at what is the next phase. The crisis that Pakistan faced, if it wants to get out of it, it really had to put money into education, start, let's say, 100 technical institutions, liberalize, improve your uh, social science, liberal education. No, you have a lot of points. Sit down, please, I'll tell you. Uh, liberalize, uh, you hold on. Capital, capital investment will come. Encourage the Saudis to bring money to start technical education, not, not the kind of Wahhabi education they are giving. A lot of things can be done. China, the so-called friends of Pakistan, can help Pakistan. And so I think uh, this is a, a chicken or egg problem. But I think if you're waiting for India to solve Kashmir problem, uh, America to solve Afghanistan, uh, then uh, we will go into trade. That's never going to happen. But I think trade has to come simultaneously. Right now, they have to appoint a team of people to look at where can Pakistan gain in this emerging international uh, economic order. We have a, we are running out of time. We have a couple more uh, questions, so I'd ask everybody to keep it short and concise. My name is Afan, and I'm from Georgia Tech School of Civil Engineering. Uh, I'll try to be quick then. You said a lead of Pakistan, and uh, at uh, one instance, you used the word Punjabi elite as well. So we need to identify what is the lead of Pakistan, and are they sincere to Pakistan if we are referring to elite again and again? Secondly, you refer to army that they are running some uh, maybe industrial organizations and something like that. Like that. As far as I know, they are on very limited scale. Mm. And, uh, but uh, the concept that I have in my mind is that army doesn't need these type of lands and all that and the housing societies. But a soldier need is like we we have very less benefits as compared to America. Just let me compare it with America. We don't have any separate immigration counters for soldiers in Pakistan. We don't have any slogans uh, written out there for soldiers in Pakistan. We don't have any uh, like uh, 
rebels which are being here, uh, given here in America, we don't have anything like that in Pakistan. But a soldier needs is that is a pride. For that, he needs to have uh, uh, for which, like his blood gets recirculated. I may get emotional, like I am a Pakistani, so maybe uh, don't get influenced by my accent or my verbal expression. No, I understand. So, but a soldier need is that is a pride. Doesn't need that industrialization or all that which you refer to. Secondly, you refer uh, between uh, uh, military rule and between the civil rule. And uh, once we say that you you referred again and again that the only development made by Pakistan was in Ayub Khan rule, and he was a military ruler. On the other hand, the only politician produced by Pakistan was Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, and to which you have referred to that he was the reason to separate Pakistan into two parts. So do we need a country or do we need a democracy? <laughs> Another thing. Okay. Well, wait, why okay. don't we take? Why don't we? We got a couple more. <laughs> You've given them a. You want to take a couple of questions? Um, maybe answer? take a couple of more questions. Some of these are uh, yeah. generic questions that come out of. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. In the earlier part of your presentation, you mentioned about the founder of Pakistan, Jinnah. Mm. He was looking for parity. Um, Hindustan and uh, Pakistan. But the yes. problem is, problem was, what kind of pro uh, parity? One to one, uh, one individual to one individual, mm. or 20 percent or 25 percent with the 75 percent. His was 25 percent with 75 percent. No, it's not that that difference. So the 40 percent, kind of, yeah. That created, and the other thing, the main difference, although there are not too many differences is from the very beginning, Pakistan's concept was non-secular Islamic state, whereas the rest of India is a secular state. And uh, the last, last thing was uh, about the decolonization when it took place. The rest of the structure between in, in both in India and Pakistan were the landlords. Pakistan still have that system of yes. colonial system. India abolished that, and that has created a lot of problems. So my yes. question is, what is your opinion on all this? Well, okay. it's all in the book, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just one quick question that may be totally off the wall, but uh, Larry Foster from HTS. Um, I wonder about what's happened since 1970 in Bangladesh as compared to Pakistan, and if you had any thoughts as to that had any um, relevance one way or another on understanding the development of Pakistan. Not, uh, oh, what the impact of Bangladesh war? Yeah. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Any more? One once. Twice. Okay. Okay. Um, Barbara Landa, just citizen. Um, America says it. This is the private. Yeah. It, it, you put up the focus on Pakistan, but could the United States help in the sense of the aid that goes to Pakistan, that a certain amount is economic or they demand, mm. you know, you want the military, okay, but you have to take this aid and you have to build some schools, you know, or institutes or, you know, something economic or do mm. something with your health system or something that's not just military and security state. They are doing a little bit of that, by the way, now. Uh, but much limited. 30% go for developmental sort of thing. Well, the rest are for military because they're fighting a war. Right, <laughs> right, right, it's right, not right. like they have a choice uh, sometimes. But the point is that they could have opened up for trade a lot more. Now even Pakistani textiles can't come to America because of you know southern states I believe don't like these textiles. <laughs> you know, yeah. We need to be more generous to whatever little niche they have. Open up those trade uh, facilities. Now, Bangladesh is the leading textile exporter in South Asia. Pakistan used to be that it lost. Pakistan doesn't have a whole lot to export. I mean, whatever it has, it's trying, but it's uh, hampered by, you know, all these um, uh, other restrictions on it. Um, Bangladesh, impact of Bangladesh was tremendous in terms of initial loss was uh, like a treachery of India to some extent, and they uh, consolidated the power of the West, West Pakistani elite that addresses to the question that uh, gentleman asking and giving them more uh, desire to achieve parity through acquiring nuclear weapons and Bhutto makes a face statement famous statement that uh, we can we will eat grass for a thousand years and we'll still get the nuclear weapons as uh, regaining the lost uh, uh, status um, and of course security too so it had a perverse effect it was not a decisive uh, defeat as Germany or Japan 
it consolidated the power of the so-called Punjabi elite I'm referring to. Um, you seem to think that uh, Pakistan, the soldier is not what I'm trying to uh, talk about. It's the leader, leading, it's, it's a 500 odd elite according to Stephen Cohen uh, that comes and goes that has uh, upper hand in de making decisions. The ordinary soldier, every, every country, you know, they fight for their country. I don't want to question their loyalty or, uh, you know, they need to be uh, finding their profession honorable. It is not that class I'm talking about. It is the interaction between the landed aristocracy and the top military elite that generates the kind of dynamics that you get uh, for the developmental path that the country has taken. It's not clear that uh, Pakistan had land reforms that is absolutely needed for any country to uh, make use of its uh, situation or put investment in education. All South Asian countries by less than 2% on education. Korea and Taiwan put more than 6% on their GDP on education. Without that investment, how do you ever become a strong state? And so I do think that um, these ideas are you know, it's hard to listen to some of these things, but we really need diagnosis. And sometimes people have to realize that uh, a certain path has been followed for the last 66 six years. Perhaps we need to think of different crafting, different strategies. And so people like you here have a lot of ideas, technical ideas, help these countries back home uh, by not to be nationalistic about it, by trying to defend everything they do. At the same time, giving them some creative ideas. I do know that a lot of smart people out there who can offer that, uh, educating the youngsters, etc. So I do think that we have an opportunity now with nobody, there is a fatigue of warfare in South Asia. You know, I talked to many of the people there, including Pakistanis, Indians, and Afghanis. But somehow, that fatigue, that crisis opportunity is not used for transforming the region, ec economies. I do think that this is a grand opportunity, uh, this transition that's going on. And the U.S. definitely should take the lead, but then U.S. is waiting for Karzai to come back, which is looking rather bleak right now. So I don't have answers for all those uh, big issues that you're raising, but quite a bit of it is discuss discussed in the book, the parity issue, etc., and the failure of the Congress party to understand what Jinnah was trying to argue. He wanted a kind of representation in the government that was formed by Nehru, not based on, you know, one note uh, equal, but giving a religious uh, minority a more uh, or equality, and that was denied, rejected straight away by the Congress party. So there's a lot of thing goes back to history you can rewrite history, you know, I discussed that, and, uh, but my effort here is to encourage Pakistan, I'm trying to be a friend of Pakistan, by the way, that they need to rethink their grand strategy. I'm not saying give up Kashmir, I'm not saying there is a security challenge, but they need to become, adapt some of the ideas coming out of Korea's and Taiwan's and Chile, another case, Pinochet was rather brutal, but he did extremely good for trade, or Indonesia, you know, so there are a lot of other examples in the world rather than just justifying the current trajectory, which will not bring Pakistan unity, security, or what it is seeking prosperity. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me.